You're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. Welcome back to Barbell Logic. This is your producer, Trent, welcoming you back to another one of our rebroadcast episodes. So today we're going to listen to the number one most downloaded episode here at Barbell Logic, and that is number 71, Programming the Post Novice, Why the Weight on the Bar Matters with Andy Baker. And really, that should come as no surprise. We've had Andy on the show many times. He's always a great interview, always insightful, always has a ton to say about programming, about lifting, and about the history and the methods of the many coaches that have come before us. So, since one of the overriding themes here in these rebroadcast episodes is going back to beginnings, we're going to listen to the very first episode that we had Andy on. That is episode number 71, and we're talking about post-novice programming. And in this episode, Andy talks specifically about why intensity, or the weight on the bar, matters for the post-novice trainee. Now, we have since hashed out the importance of PRs and the concept of using PRs to track the effectiveness of programming in later episodes, but this was one of the first times we had discussed it on the podcast, and we thought this would be an interesting look back into the beginning of what ended up being a very long conversation and ongoing conversation, while also getting to hear from one of our favorite guests, Andy Baker. Hope you enjoyed the show. Let's get to it. We're at StrengthCon, and uh, we're going we're gonna to nerd out on programming a little bit. What's up? Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. I was um, just telling you guys, it's my first podcast, so I'm that's a little bit, crazy. I'm a little bit nervous. That actually really surprises me. Cherry Blast. Well, I, th- I think I, after practical programming, I think I did two, but I'm not sure that the two that I was on that anybody ever listened or watched to them, so <laughs> I think this will be so the first one that anybody ever about watched. This one? If, it, if Andy podcasts in a forest and no one learns to hear it, did it yeah, really happen? Yeah, did it actually happen? That's right. So uh, We may have ruined our reputation by the time this one comes out, and no one <laughs> might listen to this one either. <laughs> so right. it's, uh, that's why we just, we just do this for ourselves, and then if people want to hear it, yeah, they can hear it. So otherwise, well, tough. that's right. Um, yeah, so I wanted to talk about. I wanted to geek out on programming. Actually, cool. we're doing some programming talks this afternoon. You and I are, uh, along with Dr. Sullivan. Mm. And so, for those of you guys that don't know, Andy is a co-author of Practical Programming uh, and Barbell Prescription. So and bar- and Barbell Prescription. That's right. right. Which is uh, the really programming, not just programming, but really an entire theory. Of training. The manifesto, I think. That's right. Uh, what you say, people over 40, which is true. Um, although the, I think the as master's you, lifter. Yeah, as you get a little further, it, man, it is just like in the insane, awesome wheelhouse from about 47 to 67. Yeah, yeah. We, 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 we debated over the age of where to start it. You know, where to, do we say over 50, over 60? over 40. We kind of just went with over 40 because we're thinking, when is the first time that you really have to start modifying programming? Yeah. Definitely in the 40s. Obviously not as much, you know, the guy that's 40 and fit and strong is not going to be modifying nearly as much as the guy that's 65 and brand new. But at the same point, there's there's modifications that have to happen. Sure. So Yeah. I mean, people that have listened to us know we start telling you that you're old at like 36, 37. Right. That's kind of our yeah, it, I felt the difference in my own training when I was about 32, 33. No, me too. That, that was the first time, yeah. which is what, you know, you'd always heard your whole life, you know, testosterone starts to drop, you know, early 30s. What were the and differences? Just recovery between workouts, you know, just doing doing a heavy volume workout and just feeling like, you know, 48 hours later, I couldn't go back in and train again. Mm-hmm. You know, just if backing off the volume, having to have more days in between, you know, either high volume or high intensity type sessions. Yep. You know, and just when, when how old were the, you when you started competing in powerlifting and strength sports? Um, early twenties, okay. yeah, early to mid twenties. So, so. And, and I think that's probably why you were more in tune to. I was the same way, right. right? So I, I won my pro card in strongman when I was twenty eight ish, somewhere in there. And uh, God, that was a long time ago. It is. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Ten years ago. No, no, eleven years ago. How old am I? Thirty nine. Thirty nine. Eleven years ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so I remember my recovery ability. Uh, really even the first several years, the first two or three years that I was a professional strongman, the, it tanked when I hit 31, right. 32. I just couldn't, I could do the same stuff. Right, that's exactly me I too. just I couldn't could recover do from could do. the stuff. Right. When's yeah. the first day you guys got out of bed and limped and had no, no reason for that? 
oh no reason no, it, I've never, it I, wasn't for me it wasn't like injury it wasn't like limp or like injury or anything it was just a, it's hard to describe it's just a general sense of just kind of of just fatigue, fatigue. Yeah, yeah like if i had to go lift today i couldn't I couldn't lift like 135 would be a struggle to squat. Yeah, right. You know, it would just everything would feel off and just grinding, no pop. You know, you just and it, that just that feeling persisted longer. You know, and so no you know pop. you just have to restructure your training. That's I, I've I mean, never trained and had any pop. <laughs> <That's correct. laughs> you're, you're the least athletic human on the planet. That's bad. <laughs> That's, you don't know what pop feels like now, unless it's like popping a hamstring or something, right? right? <laughs> and then you know what it feels like. Yeah, yeah. Same for me. Um, so. I'd like to spend a little bit of time uh, geeking out here on some of your programming. So let, let's talk about what you've been doing since Practical Programming. It's really opened up right. uh, a pretty successful business for you. Yep. And yep. tell us a little bit about it. Well, I've got, uh, you know, I've got the gym still. So I'm doing, you know, most of my time is still spent at the gym coaching clients. Which is North um, Houston. It's North, not in, yeah, just King, nor, just Kingwood, North Texas. Houston. So yep. about 30 miles north of downtown Houston. So still run the gym full time. Uh, but then in addition to that, I've got my website. Uh, at andybaker.com where I've got you know a bunch of articles and stuff free articles and then I've got uh, online coaching stuff uh, downloadable programs uh, custom program design so people that I work with uh, kind of on specialty programs so you know really a, a wide range of of, uh, of people I don't really specialize although since the barbell prescription came out kind of associated with just you know training older people or whatever but so I, I got people of all stripes you know and I've, I've never wanted to specialize like I've never really wanted to be the guy that trains just older people. And, and I know everybody says that you should, you know, right. from a business perspective, yeah. you should carve out your really small niche. It just, to me, it was too boring. I just enjoy working with too many well, types of people. Well, I think your niche is programming. You're, the, right. you're, a, pro, you're a very right. systematic, logical See, you thinker. you fuck around and we're niche anyway. <laughs> yeah. you, you, Whether I wanted to or not, I thought Well, I mean, you know, it's just, you're just, you're, you're a very, well, you're the you, guy you've got a really good book. handle on the, on the theory of programming. Right. I, I think, and you're able to take things that are obviously complicated and make them pretty simple and practical and put them in a program. And then, uh, you know, the programs that you, you sell, you're able to uh, direct the right demographic often to the right, right. programs. So, um, but we've, we've never really considered each other competitors because right. you are the guy. So, you know, ours is, ours is expensive and, right. it's, and it's very hands on and very kind of white glove. And and yours is l certainly far less so expensive, and you try to direct people to properly um, built programs right. for their demographic. Exactly. Is that fair? Yep. Yep. And you know, not everything can be custom all the time. And I think what we're finding out increasingly is that it doesn't necessarily need to be. You know, I get feedback all the time from people that are having you know great success with this program or that program, and they'll say, you know, why why did this work for me so well? And I said, because you actually did it. Like you actually followed Consistent. something for 12 to 16 yep. weeks. You didn't change the program up every two or three weeks. So right. maybe this wasn't the most optimal program for you or the perfect program. Everybody's looking for the perfect program, but there's no way to define that. There's sure. no way to know what is optimal right. for you. It's just if you're making reasonable amount of progress and you're not beating yourself up, you're on a good program. Sure. You know, and if you do it for 12 to 16 weeks without interruption, you're probably going to make some progress. Sure you know, on anything reasonable. Well, start, start with LP. Like we, if we start to build out this theory behind programming, we can just, we know LP works, right. right? LP works for everybody. Right. So it doesn't matter in the beginning, what your age is, what your sex is, what your end goal is. Right. If you want to just be strong to be able to play with your grandkids, or if you want to be a competitive powerlifter or a bodybuilder or a triathlon triathlete strong. in the beginning, you're not strong. Right. And the best way to get strong is to, to keep volume and frequency static right. and add a little bit of weight to the bar every single time till it doesn't work. Right. And so we do that for everybody. So that's not, we haven't, we haven't personalized programming. So the question is, we know the program starting strength, novice linear progression works as long as what we found form is pretty good right. within 95% of correct and consistency and you never miss. Right. Yeah. That's and that's it. the hardest part. That's it's the hardest, hardest part. That's the hardest part. Just get people to stay consistent. With right. It. So you've got to, you, you've got to yeah. make sure that you don't miss your workouts and then you need to be looked at at least on, on some routine basis, uh, by a coach. And that right. doesn't mean again, so there, you, you have an option, you have an, an enormous spectrum there of, of options. So, mm -hmm. so on the, on one end of the scale, if you can afford and or hire a coach in your town like you, right. if you're in North Houston, you live in Atascosa, Kingwood, North Houston, Lake Houston area, right. 
You should be going to see you, yep. right? You should, have, but but you ain't cheap. <laughs> I am not cheap. That <laughs> is he's true. He's stingy, but he's it's expensive to hire him. <laughs> That's right. He, uh, right. Yes. <laughs> he's stingy, <laughs> very stingy. But he's expensive to hire. <laughs> right. Uh, and if you're in Southwest Houston, you should hire Randy Winfrey. That's right. I mean, you should go yep. see these guys. Um, well, you get sixty miles apart, probably. Yeah, that's what they're like. He's on the. Miles ve- apart. He's, I'm like on the very north end of Houston, fourth largest city in the country. I'm on the very, very north end. He's on the very, very south. By the end. way, not fourth largest city in the country, but largest city in the country by land mass. Yes, Did you know that. Yes. yes. So it takes the longest to go from one end of Houston to the other, but it's very easy to drive. Yeah, because you got the all the loops. Right. Right. Yeah. So you got the the beltways yeah. that go around the the city. So yeah, and then they yeah, and then the spokes that go in. Yep. So it's actually a, it's a pretty well designed. Well, and it's 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 grown out pretty well, perfectly. Right. Yeah. And so, with the exception of southeast, because the ocean's there. Right. Or yeah. you can call that kind the of, ocean. Kind of a barrier there. <laughs> it's yeah. A, it's not exactly a beautiful beach, Galveston. Hey, we're proud of our Gulf. So right. the first time, I, the first time I ever, you know, I was born in Houston. Did you yes, know that? I know that. And uh, so the first time I ever swam in the ocean was in Minnesota. Galveston. First time, first time I ever got sunburned to the point of getting. Inch and a half blisters all over my body. The first time, oh, no. people that move to from like California and the Carolinas and that when they when they move there and the first time they go to Galveston they cry. Right. <laughs> like, I thought this was oh, a yeah, there beach. is a, there is a beach here. Oh mm. yeah, it's Galveston. Yeah. So, you remember what I remember about going to the beach in Galveston was I w- we drank Cherry Seven Up. Remember mm. when Cherry Seven Up came out like 1983? So good. Remember that? <laughs> I do. You know what's good in. Cherry Seven Up. With I give up. Seagrams. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have guessed? I'd have actually never had that. Nineteen eighty-three. I don't think I've ever had Seagram Seven. Seagram. <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. So yeah, so uh, yeah, you've got the entire spectrum. So you can hire a coach for four hundred or five hundred or six hundred or th- if you're in Manhattan, sixteen hundred dollars right. a month to work with you on a on a every single session sort of basis. Or you can, if you don't have a coach in your area, you can hire somebody like Starting Strength Online Coaching or one of our other. Starting straight coaches have online coaching where you're actually going to get coached and seen, and that's a couple hundred bucks a month. And if you can't afford that, or you know, then you have options to be able to buy programs. And you also do a Facebook group, right? Yeah, that's part of my. That's part of the online program. It's just Facebook's such an easy way to interact with you know members. Of, yeah, so you've got a community that. You yeah, so there. everybody's getting the same you know mm-hmm. the same programming. Then you can go in the Facebook group and you know talk, everybody's doing the same program. It's a place for me to easily interact, yeah. you know, with them. That's not via email, so sure. you know I can get on there once a day and you know, go through everybody's questions yep. and look at videos and all that kind of stuff. So it's just such an easy format to what use. What are those questions? What's the big one? Oh, well, they're all program specific. Okay. You know, it depends on what program they're doing. You know, this isn't working for me. This is working for me. I want to add this. How do I, you know, how do I incorporate cardio, you know, nutrition stuff? You know, I want to squat an extra day per week. Where do I throw that? And, you know, it's all just kind of that kind of stuff. And have you, you know? has that given you some data to where over time you, you will tweak those programs yeah. from time to time? Right. And I've got a lot of people that, that are in there that are not, that don't even follow the programs that I send out. They're doing their own programs or whatever. They just like right. being in the Facebook group and having right. access all the time, sure. you know, so to, uh, you know, kind of a, in a Q and a type format. So, um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's the thing. And what is it? I think it's in the beginning of starting strength. It's when, uh, when, when one teaches to learn, I yep. mean, the, the best way right. to learn is, is by coaching people, you know, and every, I think everything I've put out there, you know, you're talking about being able to kind of distill things down and make it simple for people and all that is, I mean, everything that I write down on paper that goes out to my, what I call my digital audience comes from the gym floor. Right. I mean, I don't know how I would come up with content if I wasn't in the gym all day. Sure. You know, everything everything comes from conversations with clients, and you know, they, you just have to make it up. What's that? Yeah, you yeah, yeah. You know, or just you know, repurpose other people's material. Right. You know, and so every everything comes from everything comes from just working with real people and trying to solve real problems. You know, so so you you said to me that most of your questions now and most interest is in in HLM. Yeah, I think it's it's probably. The thing is with like intermediate program, we have things like the Texas method that are pretty clearly defined in terms of sets and reps and HLM gets a little bit more murky. It's, and I've always keep telling people, they say, well, you know, can you send me the HLM program or what it's, and it's not a program. It's just, it's an organization. It's a template for training with, within that there's a lot of variability. I mean, almost an infinite variability when you get into all the different permutations of sets, reps and intensity. So let's, let's explain for the listeners first to to start. So. HLM stands for heavy, light, medium. Right. Lay out the basic tenets of the template. Well, the basic the basic tenets is you have it. You have a day um, devoted to 
um, your heavy training. Now, those could be all on one day. So, you know, when you write it down for somebody, the easiest way to write it down is, you know, you've got your heavy squat day. OK, um, I also would, would call that like your high stress squat day. So sure. it, it does. It's it could be heavy relative to the sets and reps that you're performing it for. So it's, it's your highest stress day. Right. It could be high volume. It could be high intensity. I usually use a combination of both in that workout. So it, I try to get a little bit of everything in that so workout. It tends to be so what, like three sets of five, four sets of five. What uh, for you, what, what it would be, typically do you do? I, w- I would look at a t- probably a total of anywhere from three to five total sets. Usually it will be, you know, one higher intensity set, you know, anywhere from like, you know, one to one to five reps kind of all out, yep. you know, heavy top triple end set. top end set followed by a series back of back offs. offsets, okay. you know, right. maybe 5%. Offset. Which is how yours would differ a little bit from Bill Starr's original, which right. was just, it just the ramped ascend, up. Yeah. The, so the easiest way, mm-hmm. you know, the, 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 uh, Bill Starr's original, everything's, you know, kind of ascending sets of fives so very, and I, you know, that probably works too. I just typically use a, more of a sets across or sure. top set followed by back offset approach. So if we think about just squats, because it's the easiest way to think about it, then your Monday or your first workout of the week right. is the heaviest stress that's day. The heaviest stress day, you know, and then you've got um, your your lighter squat day would be in the middle, which is typically your lowest intensity and lowest volume. Right. And then your medium day would be medium, kind of a little bit less volume than the heavy day, but a little more than the light day, a little heavier than the light day as yeah, well. Yeah, so, so you're really managing stress. Right. So even though it's called heavy, light, medium, which gives that the your first thing you think about is it's this is intensity, right? right? Heavy, light, medium. We're talking about the load on the bar. You're saying it doesn't necessarily mean load. Load right. certainly has something to do sure. with it. Yeah, uh, but it's it's some combination of of volume and intensity. Yeah, I usually to drive up stress. I've, so it's I've, really high stress, low stress, right. medium stress. Yeah, and I've I've done it where I've held vo- you know volume relatively static. Um, and just waved intensity. And I've mm-hmm. done it where I, where I usually what I do is I kind of wave both volume and intensity. So just as an example, let's just to make it real simple. Like Monday would be a heavy five sets of five. So that'd be you okay. know, whatever the heaviest weight you can do that day is. And then Wednesday would be three sets of five at like a 20% offset. Yep. So that's quite a big drop in intensity plus dropping two sets off. So much easier. Won't necessarily feel easy, but it's quite a bit less stress. Yeah. That and Wednesday then, day never does feel easy. <laughs> right. No and then, how light. Yeah, me actually, the, in my experience, the medium day is usually easier than yeah. the... Than the uh, right, because so, you're more recovered. By right, that. and that's yeah. uh, that's where I've gone, and it's jumping the gun a little bit, but that's where, with, with a lot of athletes, like where I use this with track and field athletes, where I really like the medium day as like dynamic effort stuff. Okay. Because you feel good on that day. Like you sure. feel like mm-hmm. you've got some pop, Sure. You know, like we More were talking sets, about earlier. Less reps, right. fast as you can hit it. Right. Eight and sets so, of two, seven yeah, sets of three. Yeah, because it'll be, you know, like, so if the, hmm. the medium day is, is four sets, uh, or if the light day is three sets of five at, say, a 20% offset, then the medium day would be like four sets of five at a 10% offset from the Oh, so from still, the you're day. still keeping your reps at like five ish. On that's that just an, that's just an example, but like Even say for if, dynamic. No, no. So okay. like with a dynamic effort, what I would do is I would look at that total volume, say twenty reps. Okay, 10, and then divide 10, it up. Ten doubles. Yes. You know, okay. at maybe approximately the same same weight though. So yeah, that makes gonna sense. Depend. So yeah. okay, so you know, dynamic effort. It's got to be fast. It's going to be well. It depends on the person who you're working with. Like so, I really like I really like heavy light medium programs for athletes. Like I just think that's a really good way to organize training because if you look at most athletes, they have a lot of work to do in the middle of the week. And they, they, you know, sports athletes that are in high school, college or whatever, they usually have the weekends off. So they're able to come in on Monday and hit it pretty hard. They've had at least a day or two off from running and practice, whatever sport they're in. And then, you know, Tuesday, Thursday, Wednesday, they might have to do conditioning drills or sports specific stuff. And you can light and medium squat on sore legs sure. and tired right. legs, but it's harder to hit the, right. you know, the guys are probably not doing anything on Sunday. Right. So when they come in on Monday, that's why Monday's the I, hardest I get day. the most out of them on Monday. Right. That yeah. Makes sense. And then I can, then the, you know, otherwise if you're planning heavy stuff, you know, especially lower body stuff, if you're planning heavy stuff on Wednesday and Friday, well, you know, mm-hmm. as well as I do, you're not really in control. Most of the time when you're working with high school and college athletes, you're not really in control of all the stuff they do outside the sure. gym and they may have to do some stupid shit, right. you know, some, so, you know, uh, <laughs> If we look at the stress recovery adaptation cycle mm-hmm. for a novice, it's very clean and very simple, right? Monday is the stressor, is the stressor. Right. Tuesday is the recovery right. or the time after any, you know, as soon as the workout's over. And Wednesday shows that there is an adaptation right. because we are able to keep going up the weight on the bar, not just there's once. A, there's an adaptation. But three times a week for weeks and weeks and weeks right. and weeks. As soon as it becomes intermediate, that gets a little more fuzzy, right? Right. It's not as clean. It's never as clean. And that's the thing I wish we had in practical programming. I wish we had like a 
two or three page section on like the gray area. Yeah, the mess. But between all of it, because sure. I think the dividing lines are not nearly as clean as we would like They're them not. to be. They're not. They can't be, right? right. And we've talked about actually Especially I wanna, between I wanna, intermediate and advanced. Okay, I wanna, like I wanna, uh, there's there's almost no, yeah, you can't. There's, it's almost not a difference. No, so what does but that mean? Yeah. there isn't. Right. I actually think there's novice yeah. and everything else. Right. I, I'm kind of of the, of the same stripe where yeah. it's there's weekly and then there's like, you know, every two weeks versus once a month. Yeah. I mean, and then it's like, so where do you cut it off? And yeah, you don't know. You know right? So, right. That's where it has to be individual. Okay, right. so hang on. So I'm going to build there because we've got to get. So when you get to heavy light medium, what is the, what are the, or is the quantifiable metric or metrics that you use to show that we are making progress on a week by week performance basis. on the heavy day. Okay. That's it. That's Monday. The only thing I look at. Monday's performance. Right. So, so Monday, the a... weight continues to go up or the volume continues to go up right. and the weight stays the same. Right. We can look at tonnage. We know sure. that there's some, more some stress. metric out a rep, out a set. Okay. Stress add, goes up right. every single Monday. Right. And as long as they can continue to hit their prescribed sets and reps on Monday, right week after week after week, and the stress continues to go yeah. up week after week after week, then you can say, quantifiably, right. we've made progress. Right. Okay. That's good. Perfect. Um, okay. Good. And then, so, you know, and then typically what I do is, you know, when we laid out somebody, you know, for, for somebody just on paper, I'll show, you know, everything, all the heavy stuff on Monday, all the light stuff on Wednesday, all the medium stuff on Friday. But that's usually not how I do it. I usually like to have one heavy lift per day. Right. You know, so it's like, you know, heavy, light, medium, for the squat, but then for your pressing movements, it might be, you know, light, heavy, medium or, or sure. whatever. So that we, we are going heavy, heavy, heavy. Right. Right. Yeah. Cause no, I mean, all your slots, it just doesn't work heavy. very well. Yeah. Though. And it's not, it's not efficient. The light day is too easy. Right. You know, right. you come in, you don't have, it's hard to, I know for me personally, I, I can't gear up to go in there and just do a bunch of light lifts. That sure. I know I'm going to make it's like, almost I, not I, enough stress. I, right. I want, I want at one, at least one lift that I really have to focus on. Sure. So it's like, okay, heavy bench day. Like I got to go in today. I got to kill it on the bench, but then I got light squats and power cleans or something like, but then do you still try to make Monday as the heaviest stress day across the board? It usually it is be, because right? of the squats because, because automatically when, because the squat is the hardest lift, right. then if there's a heavy squat, and, and a lot a, of times, the, a, a lot of times, the bench winds up being on the on Monday too, just because sure. the organization for the pressing usually it makes sense where it's heavy bench, and then we overhead on uh, Wednesday, right? And then on uh, Friday, Friday would be a medium bench, which for me, I, I'm I'm if I can, I don't like to introduce too much complexity in terms of uh, you know. So when we get an intermediate trainee and we introduce them to heavy light medium programming, you know, minimum minimum effective dose of complexity sure right so the first thing we're changing is uh uh sets and reps sure. absolutely and, and then ex then variation and exercise yes and so but i might make small changes you know something like moving from you know a, a bench press to a close grip bench sure. press is not the, exactly is a, a pretty tiny change. right if you're not right. athletic enough to handle that sure. or, or, <laughs> or or pausing it for a two count yes you know so sure. for something like that i will make the medium day loads harder and i tell my lifters that all the time it's like there's little things we can do we don't have to just put load on the bar we have right. a light day or a medium day there's things we can do to make this lift harder one we can pause it you right. know one we can change our grip or we can change our stance yep. you know or so, we can just move it faster and that's right. what I started doing the dynamic stuff. It's like, you know, he's, you know, the lifter says, well, this four sets of five bench feels a little bit easy. So like, we'll move it faster, you know, right. explode in every single rep and then let's shorten the rest periods down too. Yep. you know, so it's the same amount of overall volume and load, but you're making that exercise a little bit more stressful. Sure. So, you know, people want to train hard. They don't necessarily, I, I do, I don't want, yep. I don't like to go in and just have a light day. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A complete light day. Right. Yeah. It makes sense. Do you, uh, since you use this heavy light medium mostly for athletes, I would assume there's more variance in the pulling exercises yeah. before anything else, right? You're doing yeah. a deadlift, and then you might be doing a power clean. You might be doing a rack pull or an RDL or like what yeah, other things so that you tend to use there. The thing, if you work with like a like a sport athlete, and especially um, you know, especially one that is going to go play, you know, say college ball or whatever, and they're going to be like in track and field or football or whatever. Even if even if you're not the biggest fan of the Olympic lifts or the you know the variants, they're going to have to do those when they get there. Sure. And you want to make you want to prepare those kids as much as you can to get to their freshman year, their strength and conditioning program, and right. you know be able to power clean some 
you know, some weight. So uh, the, the Olympic variants really, really fall neatly into the heavy light medium program really, really well. So, you know, it's very easy to have your, you know, your heavy deadlift day as just a deadlift. Heavy is the deadlift. Right. Heavy is a deadlift. That's light pretty, that's pretty is, easy. Light is a power snatch, snatch, snatch and medium is a power, power clean. clean. And that's, right. that's, I mean, it's, yeah, real it's simple. real, real simple. Um, you can organize it however you want. You know, if you have a, um, you know, you can also just do if you have one or the other. So you say so you have a guy that just really sucks at the power snatch. You can just have him power clean twice, you know, once heavier, once lighter, sure. you know. So there's there's a lot of ways to do that God, I think for that, a general. That just makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. It's su- it's super easy to do that. And and when you're doing that, too, the, the benefit of doing that is that even though it's a light pulling day and you're going to power snatch, you're power snatching maximally. Right. I mean, you're still right. probably right. I'm still probably doing singles. Right. On the power snatch. Yeah, they're doing as heavy as they can, but it's right. still not still light, that much weight. You know, it's yep. still it's concentric relative. Only. Yeah. There's very little eccentric movement there. And the same with the power Doesn't clean. Doesn't make you sore. You know, it'll probably be no more. It's usually my favorite method usually for those, you know, those, those types of kids at that intermediate level is really nothing but singles. And I'll do them timed, you know, every 30 seconds to a minute, pull sure. a single. You know, there's no form deterioration. We can use heavier weights. You know, builds good work capacity. You can get in a lot of volume with just a bunch of singles in a real short period of time. Yep. So that's usually how I use that. With a more general strength trainee. Yeah, I was going to say, so the middle-aged like, person who's not going to Olympic lift. Right. Yeah. So I will either do, um, you know, if they're not going to Olympic lift at all, then the, the light deadlift day is usually going to be some sort of back movement that does not involve the low back. Because, you know, I just haven't had luck with... So rows? Rows, you know, even if they have to be chest supported or something like that, it depends mm-hmm. on who you're working with and what kind of, you know, the, the low back is the area where you have to be careful with because if you if you beat people's low backs up, it affects everything else. Sure. It affects their squatting and pressing, whatever. So, you know, chins, you know, if they're, you know, that's always good midweek type break. And then the heavy day is still can usually going to be the deadlift or a rack pull. So I usually don't ever deadlift and rack pull in the same week. I've not had good success doing that personally or with people. So it'll be the rack pull or the deadlift on the heavy day. And then the, the lighter day would be either like, or the uh, medium day would be like, uh, you know, just a little bit lighter deadlifts, but maybe with a little bit more volume, two or three right. sets of five, yeah. or my personal favorite is just stiff legs. I've always had the best carryover to my deficit. deficits. I like yeah. deficits. Yeah, deficits is a similar work well. sort of thing, right? So you're actually, if you start to look at um, the way we can increase stress, with exercise selection, right. by changing the exercise selection, I have a theory that we do one of two things when we, when we choose an exercise variant of the main lift. We can increase stress by increasing range of motion, mm-hmm. which, which essentially increases time under tension. Right. So it's essentially a function of volume. Right. A deficit deadlift compared to a deadlift is is more work, right. more time under tension, and essentially yep. more volume, even with the same set right. rep scheme. Yeah, I would agree. Or we do the other end of the spectrum. We shorten the range of motion, higher intensity, like a rack pull, right? right? Uh, shorter range of motion, less time under tension, and we still can drive up the stress because we're driving up the stress with intensity there. Right. So, th- so those end up being a function of intensity. So uh, press lockouts, rack pulls, floor presses, board presses. Right. Things like that, and uh, and almost all of those fit pretty neatly into one or the other, right? right? And yeah, so you do. know, a pause squat, it's more time under tension. A tempo squat, it's more time under tension. Uh, and then you just you also have to go. And my experience has been too that anything that you're doing dead stop out of the rack pretty much qualifies as a heavy day sure, movement it's hard. because right, those so types hard. of things people underestimate the 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 difficulty of doing say like dead stop yeah there's no de- rebound dead stop paused ben- benches you know right, starting right. with the bar you know an inch above your chest where you have no oh, you have no tension <laughs> built up in your you know in your pec and, and you know doing five to ten heavy singles like that you know yeah. it's just it's it is brutal it's hard to recover from almost to the point where it takes more than it gives back you know in sure. certain in certain you circumstances be careful how to manage the stress you know there. and um but so that kind of stuff definitely qualifies as as heavy work and and then you just have to go a little bit with experience of just having had done a lot of that stuff yourself you know what is your recovery like i don't know if you've had the experience with rack pulls where you know i've gone in you know and loaded up you know 600 plus on a rack pull and pulled it for reps and then like you go try it a week <laughs> later and like i can't break 405 off the pins yeah so i actually <laughs> you know? have found that that my lifters want Either a rack pull or a deficit deadlift crushes them, but not both. Right. right. So, like Santana, can deficit deadlift all day, every day? Like the guy's just—it's weird. It just doesn't nope. affect him. But if he rack pulls, he's wrecked for a while, a week. Right. So, is he naturally pretty fast off the floor? Well, and he no, trouble locking he's out? not. Right. So that's what you would think. It's just—that's just not the case. Now, uh, no, he's actually 
no, he's he pulls with pretty standard speed uh, or or pretty consistent speed throughout the lift. So that that is what you would think if somebody's really good off the floor, then maybe their deficit deadlift is just not that big of a deal. But that yeah. just doesn't seem to be the case. I, I'm I'm specifically looking at. Um, the amount of fatigue or performance decline we get from doing that lift, uh, you know, how long does it take to recover from that period? Right. And for Santana, a rack pull kills him and a deficit deadlift doesn't. For me, it's the exact opposite. Right. I can do an 800-pound right. rack pull, and the next day I'm like, oh, I'm fine. Right now, that rack pull is also usually um, with straps because right. it's really, really heavy. Right. right? So that's some, there's something about really, really heavy in your hands. Oh, I, I agree 100%. That wrecks you. I don't, yeah. know, I don't know why or, or what does it. Um, but a deficit deadlift, dude. <laughs> deficit deadlift, the bottom of my my rectors down at my ass just, oh, they're just killing me, right? So hard. My, to my guess your... is it would have something to do with build as well. Yeah, you know, sure. height yeah and, that makes sense. Right. It's, yeah, that's it's true. Certain lifts are going to be, you know, and there's difference between a two-inch deficit and a four-inch deficit. Right, you know, right. Obviously. Which I, I oh, never you know, use more so than a two-inch deficit. I never do either. I just I, I don't two mats, so mine is, you know, not even two inches. Yeah, it's That's what I do, inch and a half. Right. Isn't that weird, though? Yeah. You and I have never talked about that ever. Right. And we've both, we just programmed for decades, and we found out that it carries over. Why? Well, because the back angle doesn't change right. a lot in a one and a half, one inch, one and a half inch right. deficit. When you go to a four inch deficit, it's a squat it doesn't look like a deadlift right. anymore. It and and it's, it's, it's really dangerous too, honestly, I think, because of the position it puts you in, you have to drop your hips so low. The bar's way out in front of the midfoot right. when it comes off, but right. you're able or, to generate a lot of leg drive. Or if you keep your hips high, it's your hips leg. are way above it's your stiff shoulders. Leg. Yeah, yeah right? it turns into a stiff leg. That's right. Yeah, yeah. so which is not a bad lift either. Right. It's not a bad movement. Pattern. We had a lot of these conversations several years ago when we were doing practical programming, where we had never really talked, and we started talking about programming, and it was like we reached a lot of the same conclusions independently. And then you right. guys made and out. it's like, and it's what? And what? then you made out. No, he's just saying oh. in general, like just, <laughs> oh. not just me and him, but like just everybody having this conversation with Sully, Rip, and, you're, and you've got all these guys that have been programming for years, and you start realizing like, oh, we all do the same thing, right? and you didn't do it for any actual like scientific data-based reason. Yeah. You just did it because over time, experience had showed that this is what works. Right. This is what our people respond to. This is what we respond to in our own training, and, and uh, that's why you can't buy experience, right? No. You can't, And you can't just look at... Well, the data just says this. Experience actually matters. It has to, right? And so, um, yeah. The, the I mean, data is only useful when it, it it articulates something that has already been observed in practice, sure. is what I think, is, that, is the, the way that I look at the, kind of the data, rather than the other way around. Not, not looking at the data first and then trying to replicate programming or, or methodology right. that comes from the data. Right. You, you've it's got a it. terrible way to do it sure. because the data shows all kinds of stuff that are irrelevant. I right. mean, we've gone over this, I'm sure you guys too, in the podcast of, you know, these crazy, ridiculous programs that you would never put somebody on, but that, you know, in a lab environment show some increase in sense. hypertrophy. Sure, right. But that doesn't mean anything. That doesn't Correct. mean that one set of 20 leg extensions three times a week is a good strength training protocol. Right. It just <laughs> happened to work for six weeks on a group of untrained people, sure. you know, so... Data is good when it expl when it can articulate something that we kind of already have observed in training, but don't necessarily have a great explanation as to why it happens. Sure, you know we just but we know that it does because we've seen it happen enough times. Yeah, or we can actually utilize a scientific method and we go, okay, this is what I think works. I'm going to create. I'm going to make this hypothesis. We're you know right. we're going to debate it and we're going to drink whiskey and we're going to talk right. about it and then we're going to lay it out and then we're going to test, test it. it. Right. And then we're going to see what the data tells us, right? Because now we're actually testing this right. hypothesis, and uh, it works pretty well. It's just so there. hard. It's so hard with this type of stuff to get any type of good, you know, scientific method. You know, it's just it's, it's hard to control because it's it's human behavior. Right. You know, even There's in a lab no environment, squat. right? It's just it's just so <laughs> well, it's so difficult. Control and you can't you can't control non-productive stressors as a coach. Right. right. You right. can only control well you can fuck up and do non productive stressors, right. but I can't control if, if one of my clients' girlfriend breaks up with him on Thursday right. night, right? Or if he got the flu, ran ran a fever, right. got in a car accident, what whatever, like any of those things. And so to actually derive data, e even if you take everybody out of their environment and put them in an actual lab and make them sleep there for six right. weeks. You still, man, they pick up some cold. Right, right. right. still all like, kinds of stuff that yeah, introduces so, in there. So. And it's just whatever, and so you just can't. So we do the best we can, and we take thousands and thousands of lifters that we've coached over over decades of years right. between you and me and Rip and Crazy. Sully and all these guys. And and when you start to look at it and you go, well, how did we come up with the idea that but it's t completely separate from each right. other, this is the thing that worked? It's right? just some, there's something about just intuition that, sure. that leads you into the right – 
lead, you know, lead, it, it's what I look at, and, and it goes back like with the volume and intensity type type debate of you know what what drives progression better, volume and intensity, and the and the answer is both. Of course, and we've all observed people where. You know, this is what happened with with bodybuilding back in the days with the you know the what was it the what's his name Mike Menser Meltzer yep. the, the Menser. high intensity guy. Yep. So you know everybody was you know he got these great gains and supposedly from this you know one set to failure and all this kind of stuff. But if you look when all that stuff started, those those guys had been training for decades on yep. extremely high volume. He was already crazy program. strong. Well, their 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 body was, they had adapted to the volume, and right. then and so and when had you, not adapted to the intensity. When you when you pull the volume mm. away and it, and introduce them into the can we still use the word supercompensation? Or well, I mean, it's fine. What yeah. word is replaced? That th- I, I understand. What that you're thing saying. that looks like supercompensation. Right. <laughs> <isn't actually laughs> super the word we used to use. So whatever. But that when you when you have a lifter that's been training with a ton of volume for a long time, and you pull that volume back, let him recover a little bit from not you know doing these crazy you know the Arnold type routines. Which they is actually what all those realize guys the adaptation. Yes, is that's what, what exactly. They realize and then the they adaptation. Go, they go, oh well, it's higher intensity that works, and it's like no, no, no. It's higher intensity on the back end of really high volume for a prolonged period of time sure, right. and people see that all the time so they you get these guys that are maybe not training with a lot of volume they're training you know maybe they're just squatting once a week up to you know one top heavy set that works for a good long while and then they kind of stagnate well then they go to a three day a week squatting program yeah, with more volume, volume they, back they, in yeah and then they start progressing and they go oh volume's the answer and then you know a year later they've stagnated again they go right. well, volume suck and it's so it's like volume goes up and then it has to come down and then it goes up and then it comes down and it's only that repeating process of of building volume pulling it back building well, volume, it's, pulling it's it this back. idea we were talking That's about, about works. stress sensitivity versus resistance right like i get the more times i'm exposed to the same stress right i build up a resistance to that stress it, re- mm-hmm. it, re- it requires a bigger bolus of that stress every single time every single every progressive time i do it in order to elicit an adaptive response and at some point if i just push intensity 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 at some point intensity stops working right, right. but the same occurs with volume Sure. It's volume, 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 and so that's why we're constantly trying to manage the two. Um, Hambrick and I were talking about this the other day. Think about what happens when you know, we were talking about the stress recovery adaptation cycle for an actual novice when it f- when it feels clean, right? When right. it feels like it's the you know each session is the stressor, then you've got your recovery, and then the next okay. session shows the adaptation occurs, right. right? Well, actually, at the end of novice LP. That's obviously not what's going no, on. No. Right? Not at like all. there's clearly fatigue present clearly, yeah. from Monday to Wednesday. Right. But for the last, let's say the last three weeks of whatever, let's say three weeks, last three weeks of actual LP, mm-hmm. the guy still is able to put more weight on the bar and make progress. Right. But complete recovery is not even no way. No. close to occurring. No. Right. Now, here's the here's the question. Why does LP actually stop working at that point? Is it? We is a, it? We have a theory. Wait a minute. I have a theory. Don't don't poison the well. Okay. Okay. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Go poison the well. <laughs> oh. <laughs> He's like, save my ass. Right. Okay. So is it because you're not able to add weight to the bar, therefore you're not able to induce enough stress to elicit an adaptation, to drive adaptation and strength, or is it because by the end of LP – there's enough fatigue present that you're not able to recover from the heavier and heavier progressive loads. So you can't make progress. Right. I, 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 it's both. I think think it's both. I I think it's both. I think it's both. And I think I, I tend to think it's, you know, is it 50, 50? I don't think so. I I don't think we can know. Yeah. I I would, I would lean towards it's more of the latter of the, of the fatigue being present, but it's definitely both. I think it's It's, different for the different lifts. Yeah, oh, that's probably so, true. So that's what, probably uh, true. So our constraints yeah. in LP are three sets of five. Right. Yeah, let's say you can't, you can't change the volume, right? We're so, sticking with three sets of five. And so for the presses, he can't put more weight on the bar, but it's not recovery for the press. My, 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 so I look at it from, so I immediately, when on questions like that, I immediately Squat. start, I, well, I immediately start <laughs> thinking of a client okay. or, or a person right. when right. I'm training. What would I do in that? What do I do in that situation? Do I immediately to, increase volume on that guy? You have to change no. the re, you, you change no. the rep scheme. I do, the, but, but maybe the volume 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 must go up, but not today. So what do you do for for a guy like that towards the end of? So let, let's take the squat. I, my mind automatically goes to the squat because of of kind of who we are. And what well, we do. That, that's so, why I said press. Because no, I think you're right. You're right. It's it's different. The recovery is what puts the brakes on the squat at the end right. of LP. I, I'm pretty sure. Okay, but here's but here's the question. On Friday, let's say that this person squats 335 for three sets of five on Friday, and it 
either damn near kills him. Let, let's say he misses. Let's say he goes five, four, three. Mm-hmm. Okay, that so is no shit. The end of LP, basically. What so, do you do with that? So guy? I have, and this is in practical programming, but I have a little thing that I've done for a long time with people like that, and it lasts about a month. Okay, you know, it's not a long term solution, and so, but I look at how the guy is failing. Is he failing like the first set? That's so on three sets of five. Is he going? Is he coming in and going and only getting three f- or four, 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 three, or is he going five, five, two? Okay. Okay. Yeah, How is he, it. is he just running out of gas yep, by that third set or is he, or is he coming in just not able to yep. do it? Yeah. Sure. If he's still, if he's able, if I'm watching his first set and it's a pretty good, clean set of five, then I'll just keep having him in squat the one top set of five yep. and he'll can still run an LP on that and then just do a back off set or two at a slightly reduced weight. He can do a five RM three times a week, adding weight. So still a linear progression. He just can't do 15 reps of that. Correct. And you will, that is definitely the case with your, um, I'd say your, you know, your, your better genetically gifted lifters, your younger guys, like your, your, uh, you know, I go back to the track and field and stuff, the shot put guys and stuff like that, that are super explosive and, they're, they're, that's how they're going to fail. Like sure. they're going to be able to do it, but they're not going to be able to carry that out for 15 reps. Sure. If they're coming in and they're, you know, their, their workout on Monday is, you know, four, four, three, or, you know, three, three, two, or something like that. You know, if it's a miserable failure, it's probably time to just change programming ra- rather than trying right. to, you know, I don't believe that people should try to just beat the shit out of themselves at the end of LP and milk out every last single pound out of the bar because it makes whatever you transition to after that too hard to... Sure, the the transition to the next thing has got to be uh, a reduction in stress for the first several weeks. It has to be. It has to be your first... You don't call it a deload, but it has to be a deload. That's what it is. Well, and also there's the mental side of that too. If you push somebody really, really hard on LP, it's... it's super hard. It's it's, it's, to go in. It's it's way harder than anything you'll do as an intermediate or an advanced. That's why you can't take them from that on Friday of like the... the, For the three or four weeks, they've done the hardest three sets of five of their life. And on Monday, go, time to start Texas Method, five right. sets of five, really heavy. Right. Well, I never do that anyway. No, like, nobody would. Yeah, and you it's, wouldn't do that. No, and, and so that's where, you know, and then, but it, going back to the, the LP, if, if they're coming in and, and not getting that first set, then you can do the same thing, kind of a little bit of a reduction in, in load by just having them do, you know, run out like three triples. That doesn't last as long. Mm. That maybe is like two or three weeks. Okay, so we do the so, same thing. So wait, let's, let's build out the actual theory for this. So you, you're giving the practical, which I agree with all of it, but I think we have to understand, like, why does that thing work? And so for, for us, first, if we go back to if it's if – it's, let's talk about the squat. If the, if the problem with the squat is that the guy's not able to recover, right? then it would make sense, theoretically, that we could just let him recover longer right? and he would come up and be able to go back up. And that actually might work a little bit. As right. a matter of fact, we do that right. often because what we'll do is we'll actually – I will often move to a Wednesday lighter squat day right. – before I put them on sort of a Texas method, like volume light heavy, right, uh, or a heavy light medium, or so what I'll do is I'll just make the win- I'll just make Wednesday a twenty percent back off day, right. and then they're able to k- Friday and Monday still look identical. Yeah, three sets of five, three sets yep. of five, and they still go up, and that works for two or three weeks, and right. they do it right. But at some point at the end of LP, the lifter isn't able to go up in weight, and he's not able to recover enough from what he's already done. Because by the time he did, and and all of that and all of that fatigue dissipates, mm. yeah, detraining. detraining has right. occurred. Yeah, yeah, and that's why we have to start manipulating volume right. and intensity together to play with stress, so that the lifter is able to make progress over the long. Yeah, because you can't just take more days off. Because you can't that, just you take just, more days because off. You detrain. train. You that's detrain. train. Right. But right. you have to train often enough and heavy enough in a way that allows them to still progress, and you sure. can't have continual degradation and performance. So then the next step is what you just said. I am of the opinion. I also would say that this is definitely an opinion of mine and not, I think I can, I can back up the other stuff with decent sort of, sort of at least logic and reason. If not, if not data on, on this one, I, I would say, here's what I do because the adaptation we're trying to get is force production, right? People forget that the object of the I game know, is weight on the bar. It's right. It. Then and 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 it's not it's not man I I hate the fact that 
that we, when we say the word intensity, what we're talking about often or what people think we're talking about is percentage of one rep max. Right. Now, right. I understand, as you organize programming, I use programming that uses percentages because how else do you actually lay it out? Right. You, you, there's people. no other way to right. represent. That's what, like when we it's, did practical programming, yeah, RIP was very do? against percentages. But you start laying out programs, there's no way to show rel- relativity. Yeah, yeah, you can't Somebody say, that reads practical right. programming right. is going to be like, well, Andy said this guy does 340, and so uh, what would that be for me? Right? That's right. too hard to do. But, but – Absolute intensity, magnitude of the, the weight. actual the actual weight on the bar actually matters. It actually, obviously, matters. right. Yeah. So if you take a guy who squats six hundred pounds, can that guy make progress, drive a strength adaptation with a sixty seven percent squat, which is a four hundred five squat? And I would say yes. Yes, we a talked about that on the phone. Can the other do day. a four hundred five <laughs> squat. Yeah. yeah. Right. But <laughs> Sybil, my eighty two year old lady that deadlifts one forty five for a set of four. 67 percent 67 percent is taking out the trash is a waste right it's a waste it's taking out the trash that's exactly it's taking out the trash that's right you said a really you said a really good thing to me the other day you said nursing homes are full of people doing 75 percent intensity sit to stands right and they don't get better right it doesn't so why don't they get better well because they're they're 75 percent isn't heavy at all right but somebody who squats 600 pounds is right and so because what we're trying to drive up progressively is stress. Right. And three sets of five at 405 or four sets of six or six sets of three, that is a lot of stress. Right. Well, Sybil can walk in and deadlift 95 pounds for 60. Right. She yeah. just do it all day. Yeah. Well, you want me to do this till tomorrow? That's fine. It's not, it's not enough stress to drive adaptation for her. Her threshold, I know for Sybil, I've actually been thinking about it since we've been talking oh, about it. Yes. So her top, what's her? What's her, her best deadlift is 145 for a set of four. She missed her fifth. She has to pull over 125. Nope, 135. Is that yeah. right? 125 okay. doesn't do shit for her. Be, yeah. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I tried I it the other it. day. I was like, let's do 125. You know, she was like, you know, she plays organ at, and, and she, it was Easter and she had family in. and she. So I'm so it, tired. It she doesn't even like, really preserve adaptation no, that well. That's like right. Like if you take older people. I don't people, even think it that's, maintains. That's why when, when we did the bar Barbell prescription. We were. I was. I was insistent that intensity dependent was in was in the text because they are. If you. That's right. That's why when we deload. If you look at the way we deload on, in the barbell prescription, it especially for the yeah. older. You know, the older they get, you look at their their the prescription for like a midweek deload. It's really low volume, but the it's weight volume. doesn't come down that much. That's it's right. like it's like deload with like one triple. Because why? Because we know that volume is the thing that the older population has a harder time recovering Absolutely. from. Yes. They can do it. Now, again, science would say that the older you are, the more female you are, the more vegan you are, the less testosterone right. you are, right? that you <laughs> are a non-responder, the, the more hambrick you are. Right. Yeah, just it's, uh, you need more work, more work, right? a bigger bolus of work to be able to get an adaptive response. That's what science says. Only all of our experience says that's not actually what happens. That's not actually what happens in my experience. That at all. what we yeah. see is that the more female you are, the older you are, the less robust response, the less protein synthesis you have, you actually have to go heavier. It's why we take women to five it's, sets of three. It's why you and, go heavier, and it's all, and 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 you can't get away from the fact that as intensity goes up, volume has to come down a little. It bit. has to at some. You point. can't you can't do a light day with a guy at a at ninety five percent of his of what he did on Monday right. and, and do three or four sets of five. Okay. So that means like, so that now we've come full circle on this, on this theory, which means what I know you do often and what I do most of the time, what you do most of the time is that at the end of LP, when I can't make a intensity increase for three sets of five, I start trading off volume for intensity. Right. And I start going to three sets of three, you know, multiple sets of three, maybe a top set of five and back right. offs or top set of three and back offs or whatever. And now here's the thing. I want to be very, very transparent about this. I don't know. I certainly know that tonnage doesn't go up during that period. If I calculate tonnage, right. their tonnage on Friday at three sets of five, and then, and then I take them to three sets of three, if you do the calculations, tonnage did goes, not go yeah, up. it goes down. That's probably. right. Huh. Calculated one rep max also probably doesn't go up. I don't know. It may stay the same right. or whatever. It's, 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 it's that. But here's the thing. We think, I think, that there's something important that happens when the absolute intensity of the bar goes up sure. for a little while. Right now, this is a very short period. 
for most people, and of course, yeah. that's, who knows what that means? Because yeah. that's a four to six week. Yeah, period. It's, it's about a month. It's a, or so. Yeah, we're, we're we're going triples, and we might even go singles. We might right. go five singles across. Well, five singles across is not very much right. tonnage. No, but boy, it's hard. Something <clears throat> happens to that person. Well, they, that they've is, never been exposed to that right. stress. It's How a brand do you new stress. No. How do you know what two reps left in the it's, tank is if you've never done a no shit right. bone on bone? RP 10, right. one rep max, three rep max, five rep max. And I think, and you think, because we talk about it all the time, yep. that something virtuous occurs, that there's sure. actually virtue here. And this is right. something that I think a lot of people forget. We're not just, we. the physiological change that occurs is not the only thing that's important here. 100%. God, man, there's, there's an emotional, social, confidence building thing that occurs in this month at the end of LP when I drive up the intensity. And you know what? I don't, if you put it in all the equations, I don't know if you actually theoretically got stronger. You know how I know you got stronger? Because the weight on the bar continues to go up. Right, and right. then when I can't anymore, and that happens in about right. a month. Right. That's right. Then we start bringing the volume in but to drive the stress It's like up. at a guy that at that level, it's like I don't care what your estimated 1RM is off of your four best four sets of five. I want to see you with four plates on your That's back. Right. That's right. And I right. want to make you – drop it down into the hole and stand back up with That's it. That's right. Not knowing if happens you can. to that guy. And, and if you, can. the thing is, as a coach, again, we're not just getting paid to make people stronger because let's be honest, you take, you take a guy and you get him under the bar for, you know, six, eight weeks, 12 weeks, you're going to basically have given him what he needs already for his health. That's right. You know, you know what I mean? Sure. It, you really are. And it, let's right. just, I mean, just daily functional sure. strength. But the changes that occur when you make yourself stronger than you need to be, as a coach, if you don't I let like people that. do that, you're, you're robbing them of something. You're robbing That's them right. of an experience that they need to have that makes you not just a better lifter and stronger and able to produce more force or whatever, but makes you a stronger person. That's right. You know, it's the only thing that we can do really as you know, non-athletes to, to push our bodies. That's right. You know, what else are we going to do? We're not going to go fight in a cage or, sure, right. you know, whatever we're going to, you know, it's like, it's the <laughs> right. only realistic thing that we can do to really walk that line of really challenging ourselves sure. physically is load ourselves under yeah. the bar. The last yeah. meritocracy. I, I think right. we, uh, I think we owe it to the training to put them through all of their paces. Right. Right. You know, I, you can do heavy, heavy triples all the time. That doesn't mean that you can do your single. Well, they, they, it doesn't mean they, they need to, they need to learn it. that there's a, there's a skill. We've talked about this of before. Course. There is a, it's not just a physiological adaptation to be able to squat a heavy one RM. You have to know how to stay under the bar and not quit on it That's and right. feel that fucker right. moving up a centimeter at a time right. and know that it's still moving That's up. Right. You know, I think That's right. when we took shit about the grind episode, yeah. that's what we're talking about. We're not saying like, look, you should grind reps three or four times a week no. for six mm -hmm. months. That's crazy. But if you don't know how to grind, yeah, and, you're and, never going to set a true one rep max. Well, what are you, you there? What are you there for? That's right. What are we and, actually trying to, what are you refine? there for? It's like, if, if you're a, if you're a, if you're a cage fighter, do you want to go in there and kick everybody's ass? Right. Do you want to be John Jones and go fight a bunch of amateurs yeah. and just, <laughs> or do you want to go? I mean, he's uh, Cosmo uh, Kramer. You, you want to go in there and know the little kids, right? You know? <laughs> That's yeah. the best right. episode. I mean, I, for me, per, I'm just talking my own personal experience. You know, I'm as strong as I need to be for my health. Yep. You know, for me, it's right. about the challenge of, you know, I want to, I want to get under a bar on occasion that I'm not sure if I can squat sure. it. This is why, and, and by the way, al it. almost everybody we train who actually buys into this and gets through it, right? So McKay's, Brett McKay's in the room. I can remember Brett got to the point where his squat was like, you know, upper, mid upper 300s, not quite 400, right? right? His deadlift is close to 500. The guy's like strong enough for anything that life's right. going to throw. Yes. Like he's yep. strong enough at that point. And I actually thought when I went to him, I would be like, okay, what do you want to do? And like, yeah, I just want to maintain my strength and let's go do like mud runs and I'll do mud runs right. in my life and stuff like that. And I was like, you want to keep getting stronger or do you want to just, you know, would you want to maintain strength and whatever? And he was like, I want to keep getting stronger. Yeah. Stronger than you need to be. Stronger, stronger than you have to be. Right. So like, because uh, you understand, right? And that, and by the way, that <laughs> doesn't understand. It, because, well, y'all had Frank on the other night, right? And you can't get it otherwise. You don't understand otherwise, right? Right. So like, you can't have that conversation. Right. In week three, no, 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 because they haven't been refined by it yet. Oh, yeah, we had, yeah, we had Sanders. Yeah, on and Frank you know, Sanders. so when I coached, when he first hit his, I don't know what it was, three, uh, three fifteen squat or something. I think I told him, I, you know, he was early to mid sixties when he hit sixty five years yeah, old. Yeah, and I'm like, you know, he's like, so what's next? And I'm like, 
I don't know, man. Like three fifty is pretty strong. Yeah, like right. you know, do we? He, right. He's like, fuck that. I don't get four hundred five. You know, and now he's you know he hit what he hit four eighty in the meet the other day. You know, or four seventy five or whatever yeah. it was. And you know, I mean, he's and he's got two torn hamstrings in the process. Right. You know, and it's like is that your fault? Uh, no, <laughs> it's just it's just a <laughs> consequence of a guy that's you know. I'm not. My job is not to tell you what you should do. It's yeah, if sure. you ask my help, I'll tell you how to well, do Sanders it. Sanders is a he's you know, a Navy SEAL. And, and yeah, so, exactly. You, know, you have a, to know your people, and yeah. that's the thing. Is and he's there is no fucking way that Frank Sanders is going to be satisfied to stop at four eight. That's right. <laughs> like 500 is, is coming. That's right. Like whatever's got to happen, 500's right. coming. Yep. And, and, you know, no matter how many hamstrings a guy has to go through to get there, he's going he's gonna to get to 500. I don't, I don't recommend that to people. No, of course but not. going to be the world's just, you know, first hamstring transplant. Well, but you wouldn't, <laughs> right. recommend, you wouldn't recommend playing in the NFL for health either. Right. Right. And that's yeah. the thing that people have to understand, that what we do in the beginning is we get general people who are weak and unhealthy. Right. Strong and healthy. Right. And then they get to choose. Yeah. They exactly. have the power to now choose. Do you just want to stay strong and healthy and like just keep, just maintain that? Or right. do you want to be competitive? Right. Because as soon as you decide you're competitive, and Frank Sanders is a competitive. <laughs> right. Yep. That, yeah. I mean, that guy's as competitive as it gets. If he never, never does a meet, he's still competitive. Oh, of course he is. You know, it's not yeah. about, so when we say that, it's not yeah, about. Yeah, remember when, when, when we interviewed him, he talked about for years and years, he would just, he would run and run. He'd run these like long trail runs. And, and he's like, I hated it. Right. Well, why'd you do it? It's like, because I had to just, I was chasing after the PR. Right. He wasn't competitive with <laughs> other people. It. He was competitive only with himself. He's like, man, I don't know. I just, I just, I wanted to run a 10K in this, in this much time for me. Not because anybody else it's, knew. It's, it's, it's like the corniest saying in the world, but it's the, it's the Apollo Creed speech from Rocky IV. And it's <laughs> like, without, without some war to fight, the warrior may as well be dead. Yep. Sure. And it's like you, you hit some people, you have to manufacture the shit. That's what they call foreshadowing. You know, and it's like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, epic foreshadowing. And then Drago killed him. Right. Sorry. Spoiler if you haven't seen Rocky IV. <laughs> 30, 30, 30 year old. 30, 35 spoiler. years. I mean, it's, it's, it's corny as hell, but that, I mean, it is kind of the truth in a way. Sure. I mean, you, it's, and it's what we, it's kind of what like, what are you going to do? It's, it's what we have. Yeah, we talk about know? this all the time. Even from a business perspective with our clients, you, you have clients when they sign up for this, there's almost no, um, commitment, right? And then most of them fall in love with this stuff. Right. But it's it's for the first six months through through novice LP. Right. It's puppy love. Right. Right. It ain't it, right. nope. And it, and then some guys turn out like Frank Sanders mm -hmm. or Brett or Santana or you or me, who like I don't even know what I would do if I couldn't do it. No. Right. Like you yep. start to become like this is what this is just what I do. Right. Right. And so and and for for a business guys. I want a bunch of clients like that because right. those, those guys don't leave. Yeah, right. They stay because they're in and they, they don't get right. bored and go do hot yoga. I don't <laughs> want people who are going to get bored and go do hot right. yoga. Yeah. Right? I've yeah. never been that bored. Sometimes I do naked hot yoga. I, I think about they, what my body might look like naked in hot yoga and it, it does wait, not close sound... Wait, anything about it. I, it doesn't sound like an appealing picture to me. <laughs> would smell like bacon grease in there. Ugh. So that's an hour of this. We could do four. <laughs> yeah, we, we got to do more of these for sure. That's fine. We'll do more, but no, we'll, you know, we'll wrap this one up. Tell everybody where they can find you first. Uh, if you're looking for a local coaching at my gym, kingwoodstrength.com. If you want to find all my stuff online, it's andybaker.com. That's where I start with the blog from there. Tons of free articles on there. Look at the programs, you know, if you want to after that, so... Well, thanks for doing this, man. Thank yeah, you for having me. And thanks for writing it. practical programming. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, good. so that's the Barbell Logic Podcast. Go to iTunes and give us a review. You can email us at barbelllogicpodcast at gmail.com. And uh, please subscribe and tell a friend. Thanks. I was hatched really.